Welcome to another TRADOC Leader Professional Development Discussion. I'm Matt Sandisbert, Deputy Director of the Army Mad Scientist Initiative within the TRADOC G2, and I'm also the moderator for today's event. I'd like to welcome TRADOC Deputy Chief of Staff Major General Scott Linton and the TRADOC Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence G2, Mr. Ian Sullivan. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Our topic today is the Army of 2030, our near-peer adversarial capabilities. Before we get into the topic, however, I'd like to take a few minutes right now to allow you both to give some opening remarks. General Linton. Hello, Matt. Hey, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to host today. This is a, a really important topic, very timely topic. Uh, I'm happy to be joined by Mr. Sullivan, who is a subject matter expert not only in the Army when it comes to this, but one of the top uh, subject matter experts in the Department of Defense when we're talking about the threats we face. A few things before before we get into the, the subject and understanding it's a very uh, threat-based uh, discussion we'll be having today, but as we talk about the Army of 2030, it's important to recognize transformation is nothing new for the Army. It's something we do routinely. In fact, every 40 years or so, we go through a transformational process, and many of us probably remember what it looked like back in the 80s as we went through that, and we went through the process, and then we saw really the lethal effects that it had uh, as it was unleashed on uh, the Iraqi Army. So as we go through it, it's nothing to, to be concerned about. We do this really well, but it's a very complex environment that we're going into. The next thing it's important to recognize that uh, while it does bring much new technology, uh, new weapons systems, still the individual soldier and the leader remains a centerpiece for everything we do. And we here at TRADARC are the ones that help to build and reinforce those soldiers and those leaders for those, that equipment to be effective. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sullivan? Yeah, thanks, Matt, for doing this. Always appreciate the, the great work you do as a moderator. And General Linton, again, glad to be here, here with you. So there's an old Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And uh, it appears that's what we're living in right now. Um, we look at an operational environment that is coming fast. It's coming furious. And it's coming probably in some ways we, we didn't anticipate. And I think the big one uh, really focuses on the fact that large-scale combat operations, or LISCO, are, are back and better than ever in some ways. Um, this notion that there is still war between nations was something that you know, folks maybe about 20 years ago thought was a thing of the past. We weren't going to see them anymore. Um, but, but again, the, the operational environment uh, has a mind of its own, and in this case, we're seeing it again, and we're seeing some of the, the leading actors uh, who are called out in the national defense strategy and in, involved in preparing for large-scale combat operations. Our pacing threat of China, uh, our acute threat, Russia, which, as, as everybody knows, has been engaged now uh, for several years in, in the largest and most significant war that has occurred in Europe since the end of the Second World War, uh, fighting daily in, in Ukraine. Um, the Iranians being active regionally in the Middle East, um, not just doing what they've always done, but, but actually expanding their operations to include a massive barrage of missiles against Israel just, uh, just several weeks ago, um, which was really indicative of, I think, a new style of warfare. And then North Korea um, becoming, uh, again, a, a bigger player um, continuing on with its missile programs, continuing on with its nuclear programs, but but finding a, a new voice as part of maybe an adversarial um, access, if you will, providing arms and munitions to the Russians as they go in their, uh, their conflict in Ukraine. So really what we're seeing is a return uh, of warfare, a return of large-scale combat operations. And I think it's important to start with understanding the threat if we're, if we're gonna do it, if we're gonna really understand it. The last thing I'll say is the mantra of the TRADOC G2 is to, is to know the adversary and make sure our customers do as well. Um, and that's really what we're, we're going to try to get at in some part today. And if you really know your, your, your adversary and if you really know your enemy, you're not going to call them a near peer, particularly if we're talking about the pacing threat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, they're a peer. Um, they, their capabilities match or in some cases surpass our own. And it gets back to the great point that Major General Linton made, our, our real edge are the, the quality of our soldiers and leaders. So with that all. All right, well, well thank you both for those back. remarks. And allow me to thank you both again for joining me today to talk about this topic. 
The national defense strategy, and sir, you alluded to this in your comments, identifies five main threats to the United States. China as the pacing threat, Russia as the acute threat, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. And while we focused on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan for most of the past two decades, we've recently adjusted that focus to, as you said, large-scale combat operations as a reaction to shifts in the geopolitical landscape. So these adjustments lead to changes in paradigms and mental models, but also changes in training and doctrine. And we now hear leaders describe our army, as you did, as returning to a threat-based focus. So what does this mean? So to start off, it means that everything begins with a threat, right? Quite, quite simply. But, but again, that's something different than, uh, it's a different place than we were just a couple years ago when we were truly focusing on counterinsurgency and in, in what we were calling the, the war on terror, where we weren't focused on a specific adversary or a specific actor, but, but just on broad-based capabilities. Um, returning to a threat-based focus requires us to understand the adversary and what the adversary is, is all about. Um, it's a broader study, and it needs to focus on a number of different aspects of it. Um, from our perspective at TRADOC, what, what, we're, what we are really interested in is how they fight, and how they fight at Echelon, and then how they take the capabilities um, that they are developing and working them into that notion, how, it, how do they fight. Uh, so that's, that's really what we're, what we're thinking about. Um, what el the other point about what it truly means is that it's the start point of everything that we do and everything that we do at, at training and, and doctrine command. So whether it is in terms of preparing uh, professional military education, understanding what we're going to teach at the centers and schools, that's got to start with the threat. If it's going to focus on how we train, um, how we run uh, the op for at the National uh, Training Center, um, how we talk about the threat now in, in uh, initial entry training. All of that, again, starts, starts with the threat. Doctrine, equally so. You can't have doctrine unless you understand the enemy. That's, that's the first point of it. So everything that we do starts with the threat. Um, what I like to say is, for, for those of you with a, a poetic mind, it's literally Tennyson's reason why. Right, the charge of the light brigade. The reason why is the threat, um, and if we don't understand the threat, and if uh, we end up in in some kind of uh, conflict with the threat, we'll be at, at a disadvantage, and we can't have that in a in a world with a pacing threat whose capabilities match or or in some cases surpass our own. Uh, so so again, it's just the first step to everything that we do. Yes, and really, your your comments mirror mirror mine. That that threat drives doctrine. Doctrine drives uh, uh, modernization, and the, the 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 challenge really is to take the lessons learned that that your team of professionals are gathering and to turn that into doctrine to make it relevant in time, uh, because it is uh, the speed that we're learning lessons learned uh, is incredibly fast that we're seeing on the battlefield today. Yeah, I think those are great points, um, as General. Brito likes to say, paragraph one's paragraph one for a reason, and that permeates throughout the Army, even in the tech development side. You have to know what the threat is to begin building. Um, and we've gotten now a good look at some contemporary conflicts. Um, there's been several that have broken out on the world stage. The second Nagorno-Karabakh War, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the conflict between Israel and Hamas. These conflicts have provided us with the opportunity to observe militaries of different sizes and capabilities so what are we learning about LISCO from these conflicts? And perhaps more importantly even, what is the threat learning? Yeah, that's, that's really a great question, Matt. And I think it's, it's probably one of the, the most important questions that we're, we're being asked to think about today. Um, and it's a, it's, it seems like an easy question, but it's, it's hard and you gotta break it down a little bit. Um, the first thing I would say is we're seeing a lot of different things as we look at these various conflicts. I don't know if we've learned true lessons yet on all of them because, frankly, we're still trying to figure some of it out. Um, you know, we don't know how the Russia-Ukraine war is going to end. Uh, I'm an intel guy. I'm, I'm not a, a magician with a, uh, you know, a crystal ball. Um, and, you know, what ends the conflict might end up being the most prescient lesson of all, and we just don't know what it'll be yet. But what we're seeing, and what we're seeing in all of these conflicts, I think, are some commonalities. 
And these commonalities and these observations are important, and I think they truly reflect what contemporary conflict is. What LISCO in, in 2024, really moving out to 2030, and, and probably beyond, if we're being honest, um, means, uh, and how it's different from how we may have visualized it, say, in the 80s with the, the Soviets and the, and the Fulda Gap. Um, and some of these commonalities, I think, are, are critically important and are already sort of permeating what we're talking about when we talk about LISCO. And I think they're permeating how we train and how we, we think about the adversary and even as we start uh, thinking about PME and doctrine. And so I'll hit on a couple of, I th a couple of the things that I think that we're learning and then I'll, I'll talk about what I think the adversary is learning. So um, the first thing is that even though we're a maneuver force, it's really hard to maneuver in contemporary conflict. And that's, that's going to be a, a, result of a, num a result of a number of the things that I'll, I'll say after that. But, but there's just a lot of things on the battle space that make it difficult to maneuver. And if you're truly going to maneuver, we're going to have to work some things out. And um, we're going to have to work out, I think, the relationship between fires, maneuver, and protection, and figure out the right ratio and how you apply it when um, in order to make sure that, that it can work. Uh, but I think that's, that's lesson one. And we see that in spades today in, in Ukraine, where essentially we're, we, we see in some cases the adversaries staring across trench lines that you know, are reminiscent of the Somme in 1916. Um, we see that control of the air is very difficult, and it's difficult to, to, to actually uh, operate against some sophisticated integrated air defense systems, um, both from the ground and then when you, you know, extrapolate to a broader conflict, what, what you know, air forces and say like the Chinese P uh, PLAF could, could bring. Um, but what we're seeing is that you, you can in some ways saturate air defenses for some momentary advantage. Uh, complex attacks, multi-directional multi attacks coming in at different altitudes with different systems can defeat at least small numbers of, of some of the more exquisite systems. The battle space is transparent. That might be the biggest lesson that we've learned yet. Learned, uh, yet. Um, there are so many sensors out there, um, so much collection of information and data that it's really hard to not be seen. Um, from space-based systems to air-breathing systems, uh, just the, the, the massive amount of unmanned aerial systems that are being used across the battle space, um, it's just very difficult to, to, to hide. Um, you know, I've, I've even said that maybe the best sensor in, in the Russia-Ukraine war has been the Ukrainian teenager and his smartphone. Right where they see something, it immediately goes to, you know, they text, they send a text, and a couple minutes later, you know, rounds are 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 downrange. Um, so, it, it, you know, the old the old statement that we saw from the Starry Report, you know, if it can be if it can be seen, it it, it can be killed. Well, seeing is has never been easier and has never been more more omnipresent. So that might be the most important lesson. Uh, I already talked about UAVs, but I'll just say drones, 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 and drones again. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be a part of any battle space that we see. We saw it in Nagorno-Karabakh where they turned the tide of the fighting. We've seen them shape the course of the fight in Ukraine. We've seen, that we've seen them used, um, both Hamas have, has, have used them, Israel. We've seen the broader Red Sea conflict use the, the one-way attack drones. Um, they're here to stay and they're gonna be part of a, part of the battle space. Enablers are gonna be contested everywhere you go, be it logistics, C5 ISR, right, command and control, you name the enabler, it's going to be contested both kinetically and non-kinetically. And so again, um, understanding that is critical. And then the last thing I'll say is fires, fires, fires. Fires kills, um, fires uh, is uh, perhaps the most um, lethal killer on the battle space, uh, at least in Ukraine. And fires now is increasing in range um, where you can kill at distances that you just haven't seen before. And when you extrapolate that to a fight in the Indo-Pacific, you're talking about you know, ranging across half of the Pacific Ocean um, or even farther as we, as we move beyond 2030. Um, so these are some of the things that, that I think we're seeing. What are the adversaries learning? Um, that's a, a tougher question, but, but I, think we've, I think we can break it down in a, in a couple of bins. Um, 
we've seen the Russians learn dramatically in the course of their fighting in Ukraine, and we've seen them adapt uh, on the fly um, r relatively rapidly, and, and we've seen them, frankly, get better as a result of it. Um, we've seen the Russians make changes as the fight. We've seen them change their organizations. We've seen them change their, their tactics. We've seen them change their approach. We've seen them integrate new systems rapidly. Uh, and we've seen this rapid adaptation uh, to, a, to a fight they probably didn't anticipate um, time and time and time again. So I think rapid adaptation might be the most important thing they've learned. Now for the million dollar question, right? What are the Chinese learning? And that's, that's a fascinating question. And we could probably do three hours on that. Um, but but I'll, try to, I'll try to sum it up really quickly. They learned that uh, fires are critically important. Um, in fact, there are days where the Russians are firing 30,000, 40,000 rounds a day, right? And that's dramatic. Uh, you know, when you think of some of the fighting that we did in, in the counterinsurgency where maybe you're talking about a handful of rounds fired a week, when you're talking about 15, 20, 30, even 40,000 rounds a day, it's, it's mind boggling. The Chinese answer, and we've seen this in their writings, is, geez, I wonder why the Russians aren't firing as much as they should be. They think the Russians aren't firing enough. Um, so so that, tells you, that tells you what they're thinking. And it, it actually gets to one of their critical advantages, which is this, just a massive magazine depth in terms of fires and at ranges that the Russians could, can only dream about. Uh, so I think they're, they're learning about that. I think they're learning about the importance of logistics. Uh, hardening themselves for sanctions, but also understanding that they need to, to probably build war stocks um, because they're, they're learning that you go through them quickly in conflict. Um, I think they're also learning that maneuver is hard, and I think they've seen the impact of ATGMs. They, they understand the importance of combat engineers. Um, I think they're, they're trying to work through that. I think they look at what they're seeing in Russia and say, why aren't the Russians more joint? Within the PLA, there's a big move towards jointness. And the fighting in Russia uh, with Ukraine has really not been joint. And frankly, it, it has not converged domains effectively. And I think the Chinese would, would wish to do that. Can they do it is another question. But, but I think that's some of what, what we see them learning. Um, you know, I could go on all day about this. The last thing I'll talk a little bit about Intel. I think their understanding about the ubiquity of sensing um, they look at UAVs in a way that the Russians couldn't fathom. They have UAVs that operate from the platoon level all the way up to uh, UAVs that they would intend to work on the domain level to try to control, say, the air domain. So they're, they're looking at it in a different way. Um, so, so the Chinese are paying strict attention to that fight. They're also paying attention to the fight in the Red Sea, and I think that's really of interest to them. Um, particularly as some of the big national security challenges that they face are multi-domain. Um, they're looking at the ability of, of the Houthi rebels with some assistance um, you know, from, from the Iranians and others providing them with weapons um, who are able to interdict maritime traffic, strike merchant shipping in the Red Sea with anti-ship ballistic missiles, with cruise missiles, and with one-way attack drones. Um, they're also getting a first-hand look at how the U.S. Navy is, is defending against these, um, and the, the Chinese will, will pay attention to that and learn. Um, so much like, much like we are, our potential adversaries are studying these conflicts, taking notes, and are, are working to, to, to figure it out and get it into their own um, TTPs and really their own concepts of warfare. So I'm seeing great transparency with our, our allies and partners when it comes to sharing or collection of and then sharing of lessons learned. Uh, I was interested if, if we have any knowledge or understanding of uh, how the Russians are sharing information, lessons learned um, with potential partners on their side or if they're being closer held. That's a, I mean, that's, that's actually a good question. And it's, it's, um, it's hard to answer. And I don't know if I've seen any any direct exchanges or lessons learned exchanges, but, but I would have to think that it's happening on some level, um, particularly because you've seen a number of, even while the Ukraine war has been going on, you've seen a number of um, Russian exercises, large-scale exercises where the Chinese have participated. So you would imagine that, right. that there'd be crosstalk. 
Um, we've even seen the Russians and the Chinese do things together operationally, uh, joint patrols um, off Korea, air patrols. Um, I think they've even uh, done, done some um, near Taiwan. Uh, just, just today I was reading an open source article um, they're operating, both operating maritime assets off Japan, and the, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force was actually uh, trailing some, uh, I think it was a Russian destroyer and a Chinese oiler. Um, so, so I would imagine that in the course of this, this cooperation that, that some of that has to be happening. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and you brought up a really good point, too, as a logistics officer. Uh, Contested logistics, it, it can't be overstated. It's something that we've taken for granted that we will be able to, to move large amounts of uh, soldiers and equipment to any theater, take the time that's necessary to set that in place, and then move out uh, according to our own plan. And, and obviously no enemy in the future, especially a near peer, is going to allow us to, to do that uh, uncontested. And then, of course, the sea lanes, and then even back in the United States, uh, there are certain vulnerabilities we have. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, sir, I think that's one of the most important points. Um, you know, we always think wherever there's a war, we'll get there. Uh, but when you look at the distances and the regions, um, it's going to be incredibly difficult to see that logistics and sustainment happen. Absolutely. Um, and, sir, you brought up, you know, the, the Chinese are observing these contemporary conflicts, and really they've had the opportunity. They haven't been in combat for quite some time. They've been observing us since the 90s. Um, that's really spurred a lot of the changes in their modernization. So I think we often forget that they haven't had combat experience but have been watching us for quite some time. Um, so now that, you know, let's, let's look at LISCO now and the potential of a LISCO fight for the U.S. and turn to the homeland. So traditionally, we viewed the homeland as a sanctuary. Um, but the world's changed rapidly. You brought up the transparent battlefield, the ubiquity of sensors. Nation states, non-state actors, super empowered individuals, common citizens all have global reach. So is there a threat to the homeland, and what are those threats, if we went to war against one of the adversaries uh, we talked about? Yeah, it's, a, it's another good question, and it's a hard question with a, a really hard answer to hear, but, but the answer is the homeland is, is no longer a sanctuary. Um, I think as, as the adversaries that we face, particularly the pacing threat, look at our ability to mobilize and mass forces, it's really in their interest to, to stop that, to slow that down and, and you know, buy them as much time as they need to do whatever it is they're trying to achieve. So, so yeah, there's clearly a threat to the homeland. And we don't have to look any farther than the conflicts that are going on right now. Um, I'll start with, with you know, Russia, Ukraine. Um, you know, again, everybody watches the news and you see daily Russian strikes against the Ukrainian homeland um, using long-range standoff weapons. Um, the Ukrainians are doing the same to the Russians, um, interestingly, and in, in some very creative ways, striking deep into the Russian, um, into the Russian homeland. Um, so, so the homeland has, has certainly taken their share of uh, kinetic hits in, in those fights. They've also taken non-kinetic hits, right, cyber uh, operations have been ongoing really from the, the course of, of the whole war. Um, then we saw what happened in Israel last October um, where you know a relatively small number of Hamas operatives, although frankly a large number for Hamas, conducted a devastating series of attacks in the Israeli homeland, um, running, uh, running amok in southern Israel, targeting civilian targets to, to cause fear and terror and um, you know, potentially try to, to, I suppose, change, change Israel's approach to things. And it's that attack, and I think the way it was carried out has led to a, a very difficult conflict that has gone on ever since. Um, again, showing the, the problem about the, the homeland, it's vulnerable. Uh, so is the homeland vulnerable? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely vulnerable. Um, and again, I, I, it's a hard thing to say, but um, the adversaries, particularly the pacing threat and the acute threat, are developing capabilities to, to do so. Um, the non-kinetic stuff is kind of easy for us to think about, right? Um, we can all, we've all seen movies and think we understand cyber operations, and uh, cyber operations are very real. Um, there's a number of things that could happen in a, in a conflict, I suppose, that would, would target um, the homeland, both military targets, um, designed to um, collapse some of the systems that support the, the joint force and, and potentially even civilian targets in order to get at our broader will to fight. Um, and those, those could take shape uh, a number of different ways. And 
probably can't talk much about them in an open source setting, but um, suffice it to say, we've thought long and hard, hard about it. Um, the Russians also have capabilities, um, kinetic capabilities. Um, some of you may have seen in recent, recent media reports of Russian uh, naval vessels in, in Cuba. Um, those, those vessels are armed with a cruise missile that could essentially target anything to the right of the Mississippi River, right? And they're operating now. Uh, those, those ships are today visiting Cuba. So, so again, problematic, long-range systems. The Chinese are developing a suite of capabilities, and I can't go into all of them open source, but eventually they, they, they can target the homeland kinetically. And it's not just the capabilities. Some of it is their thinking about warfare and their, their concept of warfare. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Chinese approach to warfare here to, to sort of make that point. Systems of systems warfare. The notion that warfare is no longer a matchup of armies versus armies or platform versus platform. So it's not tanks fighting tanks or, or even ships fighting aircraft or, or anything like that. Uh, the Chinese view of war is, is designed to target the systems that support the fight. Um, our command systems, our um, um, ISR system, right? Uh, our reconnaissance strike, that's what they call fires systems. Um, and frankly, our sustainment systems and our mobilization systems, right? All those systems need to work in order to support a fight. And they want to collapse those systems to prevent us from doing what we're best at, um, which is, is essentially uh, fighting uh, a, a joint fight using uh, maneuver and our ability to, to deploy globally. Well, as they think about this approach to warfare, warfare there are sort of three, idea, three, three key ideas, right? The first one is that war control depends on information advantage. So they require information dominance and information superiority to go. That, that has a homeland implication, right? Because a lot of you know, information for us starts in the homeland. It starts in the cognitive minds of our leaders, the systems that back it up, right? So there's, there's a homeland angle there. The second, I think, is the most compelling statement about you know, the homeland in this. Um, to the Chinese, uh, as the Chinese think about warfare, they say that combat space is shrinking, but war space is expanded dramatically. So that means the, the arena where you would actually fight, the physical fight, is actually shrinking, right? Um, but the space for warfare has increased dramatically. Again, that, that has a homeland implication. Um, so, so as I think about it, I, I, I am more and more concerned about about the homeland, um, just because, again, the homeland is the start point for really our joint force. And again, if, if they're looking at systems, you know, a lot of that comes to the homeland. Yeah, so it, it's a wicked, a wicked problem we've got. So to take that and apply a, a Army Reserve National Guard uh, framing of, of, of the current issue or the challenges we have, if you think about uh, more than half the Army is Compo 2 and Compo 3. And getting them to the, you know, we, we talk about uh, LISCO, but LISMO, you know, large mobilization operations, which, yeah. which you touched right. on, uh, it's very complex just, just to, to mobilize soldiers. But then how do you get them and their equipment to the points of embarkation, uh, which can be easily uh, 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 contested along the, along the routes, whether it's uh, the, rail, the rail lines that, that uh, have choke points or it could be the use of... Um, influence they exert on unions, loading ships, mm -hmm. or other, you know, other entity, entities that, that play a part in the movement of uh, equipment and troops. And we saw in New Jersey, I think it was just a 22 caliber rifle that somebody shot out some, oh, yeah, some conductors yeah. and, and just wiped out the grid for a little Remember bit. It can that. be very unsophisticated. Yeah. Uh, and they have had decades to move uh, resources and individuals into place that could be used if necessary. So it's, it's a big problem. There's a lot of space to cover in the United States, and it's very difficult for us to cover it all and protect it all, protect all of our infrastructure. So it's something I think we'll continue to look at pretty, pretty closely. Yeah, you know, Matt, there's a couple of things I was just mm -hmm. thinking about that I probably should have touched on. But, um, you know, we talked about what it means in warfare, but, but the notion of also what it can mean in competition crisis and the transitions in between, the ability in particular to, to strike the cognitive mm -hmm. becomes, I think, increasingly important. And the, you know, a large portion of, of sort of our, our cognitive effort, again, begins in the homeland, and that's with the, the general population. Um, we've seen our adversaries try to take advantage of that in the past, <laughs> particularly in competition. 
Um, we've seen them, you know, work to sway opinions. Mm -hmm. We've seen them interfere in things like elections. Um, we've seen them try to to influence and and foster divisions, um, you know, within our own population, within populations of our allies and partners. And I think that's that's really important. Um, I think the Russians have been have been doing it all along. The, you can go back to the Soviet days. Uh, the difference now is the internet. Uh, social media makes it a bit easier. But again, I want to I want to get back to the to the Chinese and and some of their notions of warfare. Um, you know, one of their their competition sort of theories is this notion of the three warfares, right? And the three warfares again tar target the cognitive. So that's the 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 minds of of our leaders and decision makers, and frankly, the minds of populations that you wish to affect. Um, they wish to affect media warfare, so that is trying to sway narratives uh, towards their favor and use narratives um, in order to, to discredit um, using what we would call white, gray, and black information um, in, in combination, right? So that's, that's you know, some information that's true, some that's iffy, and some that's outright propaganda and lies, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third part, lawfare, right? This notion of using international law and legal systems against the adversaries. So again, all of this comes together in order to target inside the homeland and to target really the minds and thoughts um, and feelings, right, of a populace. And that's, that's in some ways the most insidious threat and perhaps the threat that worries me the most. Yeah, I think those are great points, uh, both of them, both the cognitive side, contesting our ports of, of debarkation, um, because it comes down to soldier readiness at that point. And if they can, you know, we, we call it win without fighting, although you could argue that this is a form of fighting, though not kinetic, um, you know, what you're doing is you're having the homeland, the citizens, the soldiers disorganized in disarray, fighting with each other, that degrades readiness, that that you know they're able to reach their aims that way. I want to shift a little bit and talk about Russia currently in a contemporary conflict that we're watching. They're mired in a protracted war of attrition with Ukraine. They were a force that entered that war with significant combat experience, contentious relations with the West. While they're not making the gains they predicted originally, they have shown that they're willing to allocate massive amounts of resources, both material and personnel, to outlast Ukraine. But China, on the other hand, has a massive economy, largest active military in the world, but little combat experience. So knowing that, why is the PLA our pacing threat, not Russia, and how are they modernizing their forces? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. And again, this is something that I could, uh, I could talk for a week on. So I'll try to do the, uh, the relative executive version of this. Um, the PLA, for those of you who don't, it's the People's Liberation Army. Uh, for those of you who don't follow uh, what what the Chinese are, Chinese military and what they're doing, has been in, engaged really since about 2015, 2016, 2017, that era, in what what is probably the most ambitious military modernization effort that that frankly I've ever seen. Um, it started back in 2013-ish um, when. Xi, who is premier, took over in terms of the, the uh, Central Military Commission, and he started uh, looking at the PLA, and a number of different um, failings became apparent to them, right? They had the, the five canots, things that, that, that they couldn't do, and, um, you know, all of these different bumper stickers, which, which got to why their military was, was so far behind the West. And... Really, you can go even, if you want to go back, you can go back to Desert Storm. They did a number of these, these studies. But this, this mid-2010s mid is, is remarkable because we're basically about 10 years into this modernization effort. And what we've seen is a, is a Chinese force that, that went from, from in, in some ways, the, a, a force that would have been at home in, in say, the Vietnam War um, to a peer competitor of the United States. And they did this relatively quickly. Um, they've invested a massive amount of their, their economy into, into the military, and it's, it's hard to tell where the military economy begins and the civil economy ends, or vice versa. Um, but, but they've brought on board a whole new 
family of systems, multi-domain, um, be it Army, Navy, uh, their PLA rocket forces, um, the work that they've done, um, you know, in C C4 ISR, uh, cyber, all these new capabilities come on, and everybody's really fixated on them because some of them are are pretty pretty interesting and pretty capable. And uh, again, some of them um, compare favorably to some of our own systems, or, or may even surpass them in the in the interim period. But really, it's the other part of this modernization that is is truly telling to me. It's this this notion that they understand that they need to develop a force that is capable of fighting and winning against what what they call the strong enemy. And that's, a, that's their term for the United States. Um, so it's more than just building new equipment. They understand that they need a way of war, um, an approach to warfare. They need to develop a force that is more modern, is more flexible, is more joint, um, that can fight multi-domain um, and can take on the United States uh, and and prevail, and that's that's really what they're what they're trying to do. Now they've made remarkable progress, but but they're certainly not there yet. In their own mind, their goal is to be the world's dominant military by 2049, which would be the 100 uh, year anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Um, that's that's what they're they're looking toward, um, but they're transitioning their approach to warfare from what they called local wars under informationized conditions. Some of the, the translations come out really funky when you, you, try, you try to work it. Um, to what they're calling intelligentized warfare, um, which is designed to take advantage of all of these new technologies like AI, quantum computing, in which, in which the Chinese have invested a great deal of, of, of uh, effort and resources. Big data, you name it, right, all coming together in order to give them a, an edge where they can make decisions faster and act faster, they believe, than, than their competitors um, or the strong enemy. Now, the interesting bit about this is, again, as along the path, they had some waypoints, like 2035 was supposed to be their waypoint to start to, to be intelligentized. Well, you know, there's, I, you know, I wrote an article about this, and I bring up that great strategist, Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. PLA was punched in the face by Xi. You said, yeah, that's too long, 2027. That's the year. I want, I want you ready by 27. And then he added on to that, no, by the way, I want you to be ready to, to fight and win on Taiwan if need be by 2027. That doesn't mean they're going to war in 2027 over Taiwan. So nobody say that. Nobody quote me on that. <laughs> that's not what I said. But that's the goal that, that Xi has laid out for the PLA. You'll be ready by 27. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so again, that's, ladies and gentlemen, three years from, from now. So that's, you know, it's not another POM cycle, yeah. right? That's, that's pretty quick. Um, so what we see now is, is a PLA that, that's been sped up and has been told to go. Now, they got a lot of problems. They're, they're still working through things. Um, you know, they're, they're probably not quite yet ready for prime time. But I see improvement every year, right? The, the, the trajectory is is going upward. And the thing, again, that, that concerns me is that we just see these improvements every single year. Um, they just seem to be able to do a little more. Um, you're right, they don't have combat experience, um, but they're training hard. Uh, they're, they're going to, com they, they, they have national training center equivalents, they go all the time. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's a significant effort. End of the day, they're trying to build a force not just not just weapon systems, but that, that hits really all the, the key elements, right? The, the people, the resources, and the approach to war. They're weakest on the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's he's, yeah, I'm not gonna follow that. <laughs> that's why he's, he's the best intelligence <laughs> yeah, mind in the army great, or something. Great rundown. Great so, rundown. and, and the, the point you make about, um, you know, they're, they're weaker on the people, and they're looking for decision dominance, information advantage, information dominance, um, shows that kind of dichotomy between the PLA and the US Army where yeah. the people are our strength, we rely on their judgment, they're looking more to the machines to provide yeah. their judgment. Absolutely. You said they're looking for new ways of warfare, maybe that's their, their new way of warfare, the art versus the science. Yeah, that's, that's something I've long said, is as much, uh, you know, Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War, 
uh, but the Chinese are all about the science of war. Mm -hmm. They believe that every, qu every question that warfare generates has a mathematical right answer, right? And if they get intelligent eyes, they believe they'll get it quicker than we will. Mm -hmm. As much as we love technology in the United States and we have some of the best around um, militarily, we're, we're all about the art of war. And that's because we trust our people, mm -hmm. right? We trust the, the junior officer on the scene, the, the NCO of, you know, who's unparalleled in, in the world. Um, to, to make a decision at the right point of time to have that effect. That's not the way the Chinese think about the fight. We, we come at it 180 degrees out, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a fascinating dichotomy. I would ask you about their NCO Corps, but we have a time. <laughs> we don't have time for that one. <laughs> so as we said earlier, the shifts in focus will demand <coughs> to training and doctrine within the U.S. Army. So from your foxholes, how do you see people acquiring threat knowledge across the training domains, institutional, operational and self-development? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick st uh, shot at that and then hand it over to General Linton. But you know, from the G2 perspective, I think we're doing a couple of different things and we're focusing on all three. I think at the institutional level, we're working to make sure information on the threats and particularly the pacing threat are included within PME and, and frankly within as much training as we can. And <coughs> I think the FORGE 2.5 at at the uh, initial entry training is really the, the a, a fascinating example of that. Operationally, um, the same work that we're doing is having an impact. Um, we run the Army Op4 program, so threat threat is taught right on the the fields at at the NTC and all the other training centers. We support exercises, um, you know, uh, globally, both both U.S. and and multinational. And we could talk more about that, and I think that that has an impact. And wargaming. I spend a lot of time wargaming for the Army, where, where I get to play the, the enemy commander. And um, I think all of that helps at the operational level. And then self-development, I think we've worked um, to get as much information as we can available to the Army writ large across the TRADOC G2 open source portals. Um, our Russia landing zone and our China landing zone, I think, are... Yeah are first-rate places to go get open source information about the, the potential adversaries. And so we, I think we have a suite of capabilities and, and efforts designed to hit all three. Yeah, and, and just, just to build upon that. So PME builds or provides that, that foundation that, that really you, know, you can build upon with a self-development as you look at what we're seeing in the Ukraine right now through open source, what intelligence reports uh, provide, and then of course hard rigorous training as well that, that builds those cohesive units. Um, what I will say is that we do work with ASCCs and ACOMs too to continually uh, receive feedback on the soldiers they're receiving to, to identify any gaps or anything we need to focus on and we build that into you know, our, our capstone foundational exercise that we do at the end of uh, training each soldier receives before they go to their first uh, duty station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TRADOC has a lot of options for training and doctrine, obviously, but self-development as well. And, you know, I think it's just foot stomp one more time how many products we have at TRADOC that are not only openly available to anyone, but behind a CAC wall, which any soldier can get to. Um, so there's you know, an abundance of resources for everybody to continue training uh, when yes. and where they need to. Yeah, absolutely, good point. And so let's talk about one of the tools that TRADOC developed here. Uh, one of those tools is the Decisive Action Training Environment, or DATE. Uh, DATE offers comprehensive OE conditions for training and support for scenario development. So how is DATE linked to the threats that we talked about? Yeah, so, um, so DATE's a, a spectacular, um, I don't want to call it a product because that's not what it is. It's it's actually sort of a world-building tool and uh, an ability to, you know, an OE unto itself, and it's it's broken down regionally. And what it does is it takes real-world, thinly-veiled intelligence, um, sort of fictionalizes some of it. So, um, because by by law um, and by regulation, um, we're not allowed to say we're training against any specific threat. And it also makes it easier to work at an unclassified level with our allies and partners. So, uh, so we have a series of fictitious nations, but all of it is based on, on real world intelligence. So the, the threats that the national security, uh, the national defense strategy um, posture, uh, postures, each one of them has a, has a date clone, right? 
And it was initially designed as a training tool to, to train soldiers, to train them in their, their individual tasks. But it's, it's grown and it's done things that, that I didn't think were, were possible. And it's done this because of the partnerships that the DATE team has formed both uh, within the Army, the Joint Force, and most fascinatingly, if that's a word, with our allies and partners, particularly our Five Eyes partners. Um, I'll give a, a little story, a little vignette from last year. So um, last summer, um, I spent uh, about 10 or 12 days in Australia um, checking out exercise Talisman Saber 23. Uh, Australian, it's, it was a, an Australian-led exercise held in uh, several areas within, within Australia, but largely in the, the Townsville area up north, involving, I wanted to say something like, 17 nations and 30,000 soldiers, 35,000 personnel um, from, from mul not just multiple nations, but multiple nations, navies, air forces, and armies coming together, right, in a, in a show of, of cooperation among allies and partners um, to, to conduct this exercise. Date is what underlined it. The OE that was used as the exercise was all date. So, <coughs> so the, <coughs> excuse me. The adversary was Olvana, which is one of the clones uh, for, for the nations, for, for one of our adversaries. Um, so if you think about this, right, this, and, and you know, it's out in the Indo-Pacific, Olvana is the, essentially the clone for the, for the Chinese, right, for China. So if you think about this, this, this tool that we developed, right, to support training, and now has gone broader because it's, it's integrated within our PME, Right, they're using it in a series of scenarios that support um, work within the, the educational structure, CGSC, the COEs, what, what have you. It's working into the programs of instruction as we, as we speak. Um, but it's doing more than that, right? I mean, think of Talisman Saber alone, right? The largest exercise run in the Indo-Pacific region in years. Um, by doing that, and then when you think of the partnership, because these, the same date is being used at our, at our combat training centers. And so the Joint Pacific Readiness Center, uh, JPMRC, um, out in Hawaii and Alaska uses DATE Indo-Pacific. So units that train run through the DATE scenario. They, they become acquainted with the adversary. Um, they understand how they fight at Echelon, everything that we talked about before. So you link all of this together, what does DATE do? It means it builds regional readiness, right? It enhances the capabilities of our allies and partners. And this, this is the one that really blows me away when you think about it, right? Because would have, I don't think any of us would have ever thought about this when, it, when DATE was created. It plays a role in regional integrated deterrence against our adversaries. Because if you're the PLA and you saw the United States and its allies and partners, 16 nations, 35,000 troops, move from around the globe, right, across the across the various domains to, to hold an exercise. That, that has impact on their thinking. Yeah. And that hopefully contributes to the thought, not today, because that's what the US can do. And it was date that underlined it. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable kind of thing. And it, you know, TRADOC, which is, a, is, is focused on training and doctrine, is, is having that broader role because of date. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And incidentally, date is now gonna be used on and I don't think I can go through them all open source, but another four or five significant major regional multinational exercises over the next year or two. One of the ones I can say is RIMPAC, which is one of the most significant exercises that Indo-PACOM Indo has. The interesting thing about this, it's happening because the Australians demanded it, right? The Australians, our partner said, we, you know, we're all in on date, we love it, we wanna use it, and it's the Australians who helped uh, really convince our own joint force to use uh, So it's a remarkable story. And it means that, that TRADOC is having a, an impact well beyond what we ever considered, be, really because of this OE. Yeah, and, and just to reinforce that, so I, I had the opportunity to do uh, Capstone uh, earlier this year. And so obviously a very heavy uh, joint platform with uh, you know, senior, senior joint leaders and, and organizations and, uh, and the Five Eyes as well represented and overwhelmingly positive reviews uh, of date and specifically one of the things that they mentioned that they liked is also the multi-domain aspect of it that allows them to exercise so an unbelievably successful program uh, very well received out you know with our allies and partners as well
Yeah, I don't think I can overstate its significance. As someone who's in the G2, just to give you an example of you know, how massive this thing is, I know very little about it because it's such an in-depth, uh, you know, like you said, it's not a product anymore. It's so in-depth, um, but it's had such great success. Yeah, and the thing I'm embarrassed to say, and I'll, I'll, but I do it anyway, is I was a date skeptic for many years, when, even when I worked in the G2. I was like, well, why do we have this when we could just use real world? And I, I'll, I'll tell you the great work done by the team and the work they've done has just brought me around mm -hmm. 180. And then when you hear the allies and partners rave about it, you realize they've created something special. So, so they proved their boss is an idiot and was wrong. And... Um, I'm now the, you know, like most cases, the, the convert is, is the most fervent. So. <laughs> yes, it's a ma massive success story. Yeah. So we have a, a few minutes before I, we get to your closing remarks. I wanted to throw an idea out to you um, to have you explain it, sir, and, and General Linton maybe get your thoughts on this idea that we've been throwing around in the G2 on the idea of adversarial collusion. And I'll just briefly say what it is and then, sir, you can <coughs> into more detail. Um, when we look at Russia or China as our, our, our adversaries, they, we think of them as operating alone. And while they're not going to have strict partnerships between each other or with North Korea or Iran or some VEOs, they may do some things that are transactional in nature that benefit both of them. So can you just, can you talk a little bit about this idea? And then, sir, I'd like to get your thoughts if you have Yeah, well. I, I think this is actually a really concerning development within, within the OE. Um, and this question has come up over the years, right? Um, and one of the things that, that I used to say was, well, the U.S., one of our, you know, significant um, advantages globally is our alliance network. We have true allies. We have true partners. We've fought for each other over the years. We've bled for each other. We've served on, on foreign battlefields going back to, to the Second World War together, uh, in some cases even longer than that. Um, so there's this this long history of it, and that the adversaries don't really have that. They don't think about in terms of allies. Um, maybe there's some transactional stuff that goes on. Um, but we've seen some worrying, worrisome developments. I think um, we've seen them coming together more. Um, yeah, a lot of it's transactional, but you start there's the volume, the sheer volume of it makes you wonder sort of what's next. Um, we're starting to see joint operations. I mentioned the Russians and the Chinese doing some joint patrols periodically. Um, it's more than just going to joint exercises. And I think the thing that's really sort of showed all of these actors, um, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea being the, the, the four main ones, um, the thing that's really showed them maybe a, a potential um, path forward is, has been the Ukraine war. Um, Russia has reached out to all of those actors in the course of the conflict, and all of those actors have in some way, shape, or form delivered for them. The Chinese talk about, a, and the Russians talk about, a no-limits partnership. Well, there, there are some limits, um, apparently, but, but again, there, there's, there's certainly support there. There's, there's economic support. There's political support. And, and there's, there's uh, materiel moving back and forth. Maybe not full lethal systems, but, but support. The Iranians have kept the Russians going when their magazine depth was getting limited by supplying them ballistic missiles and one-way attack drones, which the, the Russians gratefully accepted and have been using nonstop uh, for really the second half of the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, a lot of folks won't know this, but the Iranians actually make some very good military equipment. You know, some, of their, some of their missiles are, are pretty good. Uh, their one-way attack drones are, are good, and the Russians have used them to great effect. North Korea, um, you know, the, the hermit kingdom, the, you know, they, they don't even acknowledge the, the rest of the world sometimes, have um, played a significant role in providing the Russians munitions, um, you know, artillery uh, rounds and, and the like to keep them fighting. And, and I think that relationship is now open. Putin is, is in Pyongyang right now, uh, for, for example. And so we see, um, we see them working together more. We see them moving in a series of more transactional relationships, yes, but sort of with the tacit understanding that it's in opposition to the United States. And, and my concern is that it, it eventually transitions to something greater than transactional. I, I don't know if we're ready to say allies. I'm, I'm, that makes me really uncomfortable. 
but but there's definitely something more than a transactional relationship. Maybe it's somewhere just beyond transactional and almost a partner, which is problematic for us. Um, because again, each of those actors has a significant impact within the region uh, where, where, where they're located. But you know, for, for China with its, with its economy and its, its power across the diamond and Russia, even though it's engaged in that fight with its, its global influence and, and you know, three of the four are nuclear powers, that's kind of problematic. And it, it definitely makes the OE, a, as I said before, a more interesting place. Yeah, it feels like something we should something, be we, watching we got, definitely, now. And, definitely. And if it turns into something more, that yeah. could be significant. Sir, I'm sorry, I know I just sprung this concept on you, no, but I'd love some would, insight if you have some. No, no, no not at all. So, so it's interesting, I, I wonder, what took them so long, you know, when you, when yeah. you think of uh, history, the, culture, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all that, yeah. the environment hasn't yeah. changed that much in the past few years, but, but, but transactional, uh, gives me some, some, some room for hope because yeah. it is based on, you know, uh, the relationship that can change tomorrow. It's not based necessarily on treaties, uh, other than I believe right. China, North Korea, but, um, but I think there's opportunities through dime maybe to 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 pull them away to to uh to not push them towards one another and and i hope that's yeah. what we do pursue because you're, you gave the perfect yeah. example they russia was able to use these relationships to to uh when they were really down on a knee and get back, get their footing back so yeah i think that's a great point referencing the the dime and for those listeners that's referencing diplomatic information military and economic all spheres of national power um which dominate the way we look at the competition period, right? right? And right. and I think that there are opportunities within the competition sphere to to challenge uh, the constructs that that arise from this. And you know, the scary part again is you do see some const constructs within these elements, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, okay. or um, you know, work that can be done w among the BRICS, as mm -hmm. an example. Um, all of these con all of these will will create challenges, but. But again, I think you're right. I think in competition, we take them head on in the dime space. Yeah, some very concerning implications. <coughs> well, Major General Linton, Mr. Sullivan, as we wind the discussion down, I'd like to take another second to say thank you to both of you for a great conversation. Uh, you know, we were talking about the Army of 2030 and the cap capabilities of our near peer adversaries. But before we conclude, I'd like to offer up uh, some very brief closing comments from each of you. Yeah, so so just really quickly, uh, just we live in really interesting times, uh, dangerous times, but we're able to, to witness a state-on-state -state, uh, conflict in real time and take those lessons learned that we're currently using to build our, our training and our doctrine. Uh, I would like to thank the, the, the professionals, the military and civilian professionals in TRADOC who every day work tirelessly to prepare our soldiers and our leaders for the next conflict. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly echo that and I'll say as we think about the uh, the adversary one of the things I like to do is uh, I tell all the young soldiers and maybe it shows my age a little bit but um, you know go go out on your Spotify list or whatever whatever you use download Green Days do you know the enemy right um, just play it over and over in your head because we have to know the enemy we have to know the adversary because p if people are going to be at our advantage they have to be prepared, and they're prepared by understanding the adversary. Um, you know, the, the threat that we face is very real. I talked about it a second before in that it, there's a fight tonight mission. We all see the news. We've all seen things happening in the Indo-Pacific region, um, you know, very close uh, contact between U.S. aircraft, Chinese aircraft, a Chinese destroyer that you know, heaved across a U.S. destroyer at about 100 yards. We see what's going on in Second Thomas Shoal with the Philippines, um, the, the, the everything short of conflict that's, that's going on between the Chinese maritime militia and the Philippines Coast Guard. Um, we see what's going on in the, mid, the Middle East, uh, the Red Sea, uh, which, which is actual conflict, um, in, including strikes against the United States and, um, you know, the U.S. doing a a spectacular job at defending against a, a large Iranian strike against Israel and the, the work that's being done every day against the Houthis, the work that's going on in Russia to, to try to keep the Ukrainians afloat. Um, this OE is real. There's a fight tonight mission with all of that. Talked about China, there's a 2027 mission um, if the Chinese are, are serious. That concerns me because it's inside 2030, which is 
is the Army modernization target, although we, we will get large large pieces of, uh, of that modernized force uh, before 2030. But at that point, for us, uh, that's people. People will be our advantage, and nowhere more will they be the advantage that we need if, if push comes to shove before 20, in that 2027, 2030 window. And so that's why I get back to, you know, do you know the enemy? Because if you're not ready for this threat, this threat is mind-blowing. Um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to understand it. We need to think about it. Then there's that broader threat, and I'll, uh, I'll be happy to turn that one over to our friends at Army Futures Command as they think about how we compete with China beyond 2030, mm -hmm. 2035 to that 2049 point. Mm -hmm. But from, from, from our foxhole, uh, the people got to be ready, and the first thing you, you need is an understanding of the adversary. That's right. Thank you, sir. As we've heard today, the Army is consistently engaged with threats across competition, crisis, and conflict. They've worked together in the cyber and space domains to damage and deter Western interests, and their reach spans globally, including the homeland. They've been observing contemporary conflicts just as we have and are adjusting their training, doctrine, and overall modernization efforts to reflect what they've learned. The PLA's modernization specifically endeavors to directly challenge the precepts of U.S. Army dominance in the post-Desert Storm era. The U.S. Army's advantage is in its people, lethal soldiers and agile leaders who understand the threat. TRADOC is developing these soldiers and leaders today. The company commanders and squad leaders that may face the PLA in 2027 or the battalion commanders and sergeants majors of the Army of 2030 will be arriving at TRADOC posts this summer and it highlights the importance of and the need for accurate and impactful threat information. Join us for our next leader professional development on 31 July 2024 with TRADOC's G357 Brigadier General Jennifer Walkowitz and Futures and Concept Center's Colonel Scott Centel to talk what TRADOC and FCC won't do for the Army of 2030. Stay tuned to TRADOC's social media platform for further advertisements of that leader professional development. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, victory starts here.